morning, everybody. Today we are going to put together all of the material uh, from chapter six and a little bit from chapter five uh, in order to calculate tau at a specific point on a structural member. And in order to do this, we are going to use problem uh, 610 in our textbook. So without further ado, let's go over and take a look at problem 610. Okay, so I'm going to uh, put up on, on the screen here. Uh, problem 610, the directions for 6.9 through 6.12 state, uh, for the beam and loading shown, consider section N, N prime, and determine the largest shearing stress in that section and the shearing stress at point A. All right, so this brings together this whole idea. Is that, first of all, we have, um, we have come up using our idea of shear moment diagrams. That is possible that at different points on this beam, we're going to have different values of shear. Now here, not really so much, but it could be if we had, for example, a load out here, um, we would have a different loading situation in this section, for example, than we would here. But we're looking at the cutaway view of N to N prime, and we're told that the cross section looks like an I beam. Now we want to find the uh, tau, the shearing stress at point A, and then also we want to find the largest on this particular cross section. So we need to think about what all of those things mean. So the first thing we're going to do is take a look at our beam. And we're told that there is a 10 kilonewton force pushing down. Well, statics would tell us if we do a summation of forces in the y direction, if this is going to stay anchored in the wall, we know that the summation of forces in the y direction equals zero. So that means that there's going to be a responsive 10 kilonewton force right here. Now, if we were to do um, moments, there's also going to be a moment here at the wall, right? Meaning this is pulling it down like this. So we also know that the summation of moments uh, on the beam about any point is going to equal to zero. And if we wanted to find the responsive moment here at the wall, we could do that and then we would have a responsive moment here at n, n prime. Now if we were looking for sigma, we know that sigma is equal to m y over i. And in that particular case, we would have to do our statics for our moments, wouldn't we? However, since we're only looking at tau, tau is equal to VQ over IT. The only thing that I need from my free body diagram is V. So if I look at this free body diagram, and I say I have a 10 kilonewton force uh, pushing upward here, here at n, n prime, I can say that if I put v going down, right, I can say the summation of forces on this section of the beam equals zero, and this would be positive 10 kilonewtons minus v equals zero, or 10 equals v. 10 kilonewtons is equal to the responsive uh, shearing force on that cross section, which we probably could have intuited by looking at this but we need to go through the process just to make sure that we have everything straight. All right, so that means that here on this I-beam, when we talk about tau is equal to VQ over IT. We know what V is, which is the same everywhere on this beam, 10 kilonewtons. We are going to be able to determine I because it is a, um, an I beam, and so we can find the moment of inertia. Then we're going to have to determine Q at point A and T at point A. Then after we finish that, we're going to have to decide where is this ratio of Q over T going to be the greatest. In other words, where is the shearing stress going to be the greatest on this I beam? 
But in any case, for the first part of the problem and the second part of the problem, the value of v and the value of i are exactly the same. So since we have v, let's find i, and it's always that centroidal moment of inertia, uh, for this i beam. Well, the way that we can do it is to divide it up, and we gave, I gave you the formula for this um, last time, but I can divide it up into three composite areas. And since this is a symmetric I-beam, put some measurements on it, this entire height is 150 millimeters, which is 0.15 meters. And the width of the flange, or the height of the flange rather, is 12 millimeters, 0 0.012 meters. And same thing down here. And as I've said, those are the only, those symmetric I-beams are the only things that we're gonna really work with. The width of the web is 100 millimeters, which is 0.1 meter. And the width of the flange is 200 or 0.2 meters. All right, so to find I, we need to take the centroidal moment I about of part one. And then since two and three produce the same moment of inertia, we can just take two times I of two or three. Because they're exactly the same. They're gonna produce the same magnitude of the moment of inertia. Well, the web is actually a rectangle and it has its centroid halfway through at 75 or 0.75 0 0.075 uh, millimeters, it's, or it's 0 0.075 meters. So this is exactly the same as, in other words, the centroidal moment of inertia, the neutral axis of part one is the same as the neutral axis of the I-beam. So we don't have to use the parallel axis theorem in order to move it up or down from that centroidal axis or to the centroidal axis. So it's just 1 12th times the base times the height, which is, these are each 12 millimeters, the whole thing is 150. So it's 150 minus two times 12, 150 minus 24, which is 126 millimeters or 0.126 meters. Raised to the third power. Okay, so that takes care of this. But now for the flanges, we need to use the parallel axis theorem because the centroid of the flange is not the centroid of the entire I-beam. So we need to take the centroidal moment of inertia of each of the flanges, which is 1 12th times the base times the height raised to the third but then we need to use the parallel axis theorem to take the area of the flange times the distance squared between the centroid of the flange and the centroid or the neutral axis of the I-beam. So it's 1 12th base height to the third plus the area 0.2 times 0 0.012 times the distance from here to here squared. All right. Well, we know that the distance from here to here is 12 millimeters. So the distance to the centroid is six millimeters or the distance to the centroid of the flange is six millimeters from the edge. We know that the distance from the centroid of the I-beam to the edge is 75 millimeters. So if we take 75 and subtract six, that's going to be the distance from this centroid to this centroid or neutral axis. So that's 69 millimeters. So it's 1 12th times the base times the height to the third plus the area, which is the base times the height, times the distance between the two axes, 69 millimeters or 0 0.069 meters squared. Now the other thing is there are two of these there is part two and part three. So I've got everything in meters now, and I can say I bar, in other words, the I that I will use for any shearing stress on this cross section is going to be um, 1.126 to the third power, 
why do the acts of hiding from me? Oh, I'll just have to do it 0.126 times 0.126 equals. So this number is this tiny little number, 0 0.002 with some change. Multiply that by 0.1 and divide it by 12. So the first part is, I wrote that, uh, 1.667 times 10 to the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, negative 5 meters to the fourth. Um, and then we're going to have to do some working in here, but that's going to be plus 2 times this first quantity, which is 0 0.012 raised to the third power times 0 0.2 divided by 12. So we have 2 times, this is 2.9 times 10 to the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, <coughs> 6, 7, 8, negative 8 power. And then the last term is going to be 0 0.069 squared times 0 0.012 times 0 0.2. Okay? And that number is 1.1426 times 10 to the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, minus 5. All right. So working in parentheses, I take this number and add it to this number. Plus, this is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 equals. And I multiply that by 2. So I get uh, 1.667 times 10 to the negative 5. And I've multiplied this by 2, so it's plus 2.2911 times 10 to the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, minus 5, fortunately. So I can just add those two numbers together. Uh, and I get, this is I bar equals. Um, plus 1.667, and that number then is 3.958 times 10 to the minus 5, and my units are meters to the fourth. Okay. All right, so I have two of my quantities. Now the next thing I need to do is to find Q and T first at point A. So I'm going to redraw my I-beam and identify the location of point A. All right, so I am told that point A is 40 millimeters or 0 0.04 meters from the top. And the first thing I do is I draw a line through that, okay? So my thickness is just the thickness of the web, which is 100 millimeters or 0.1 meters. But now to find Q, remember that Q is equal to the summation of Y DA, or we could say Y I A I. Okay, and we have two parts, don't we? In other words. We have this rectangle from A to the top, and then we have the upper flange. And the Y in each case is going to be the distance from that part to the neutral axis of the I beam. All right, so Y I A I then is going to be Y of 1, A of 1, plus y of 2, a of 2. Okay. So for 1, my a is just going to be the width times the height of the flange, which is 0 0.012, which is the height, times the width, which is 200 millimeters or 0.2 meters. And for my, a, and then of course you see I'm doing the easy part first, right? So then A of 2 is just the area of A above A up to the 
bottom of the uh, flange. So the portion of the web, which is um, 100 millimeters wide, or 0.1 meters wide, times the distance from here to here. Well, we know that this entire distance is 40 millimeters, and we know that the flange is 12 millimeters, so the height of this chunk is 40 minus 12, or 28 millimeters, meaning 0 0.028 millimeters. Okay, so then the next thing I need to do is to find the distance from the centroid of this to the centroid of this, and the centroid of this to the centroid of this. We know that the centroid, because the entire structure is 150 millimeters um, tall, from the edge to the centroid is 75 millimeters. Since this is a rectangle, the um, centroid of the flange is half, or six millimeters down. So once again, that's 69 millimeters. So 69 millimeters is 0 0.069 meters. And then for this chunk at A, if this entire distance is 40, that means that this distance is 28, and so it's 14 millimeters down from this flange. So if it's 14 millimeters down from the flange, that means that it's 12 plus 14 from the edge, which is 26. And we know that the entire distance is 75. So if I take 75 minus 26, I get 49. So the distance from the centroid above A to the centroid of the entire object is 49 or 0 0.049 meters. So I'm ready to solve for Q at A. And once again, it's going to be different everywhere, isn't it? Okay. So if I do that math, 0 0.069 times 0 0.012 times 0.2, Q from the first is 2.76 times 10, 1, 2, 3, 4, minus 4, and that's in meters to the third, plus 0 0.049 times 0.1 times 0 0.028 is 1, 2, 3, 4, 1.372 times 10 to the minus fourth, and if I add those two together, I get 1.000276. Q at A then is 4.132 times 10 to the minus fourth meters to the third power. All right, now I have all of my variables solved for. So I can say therefore tau at A is equal to V Q at A over I times T at A. My V is 10 kilonewtons. My Q at A is 4.132 times 10 to the negative fourth meters to the third. Divide that by my I, which is 3.958 times 10 to the minus fifth meters to the fourth times the thickness at A, which is 0.1 meter. Okay, so if we look at my units, I have meters to the third over meters to the fifth, so that's meters squared. Kilonewton per meter squared are my final units, which is a kPa. And if I run my numbers, this just becomes times 10 to the First, if I bring this up and I just multiply my mantises on those numbers, so I get 10 times 4.132 times, oops, 1, divided by 3.958, divided again by 0.1. So my answer is 104.4 times 10 to the first kilonewtons per meter which tells me that my tau at point A is 1044 kPa, which is 1.044 MPa. Okay. 
So do you guys have any questions about that? Okay. Yes. What? <laughs> All right. Thank you for letting me know. So it's Monday. Is it Monday today? It is Monday. And he hates Mondays. So that's okay. Tell him he can watch the recording. Tell him it's really a thrill. He'll want to watch it several times. But uh, there you go. All right. So now the next part is where is it going to be a maximum? Tau max on the cross section is what? All right, so if we think about that, tau is equal to VQ over IT. These two are the same everywhere on the cross section, aren't they? So where is Q a maximum and where is T a minimum? That's the question, isn't it? That's what's going to make a maximum um, tau. Now, there's a couple of different ways that you can think about it. If this were a purely rectangular cross section, the largest Q is going to occur at the neutral axis. So in general, Q is going to be a maximum at the neutral axis. Absolutely. But because the flange is so thin, there's also a possibility that it could be here. But I would probably lean toward thinking it's going to be at the neutral axis. Okay, we could work it both ways if we wanted to. That would be kind of fun, right? Uh, so let's go ahead and do that. Let's look at Q and T at the neutral axis. We don't have to work the whole problem, do we? If we just find the ratio of Q to T, whichever is greatest is going to give us the greatest tau max, or the greatest tau. And let's also look at Q at T. Um, I'm going to call that point B at B. All right? And that'll just give us a lot of practice as well. All right. So at the neutral axis, what is Q? Well, first of all, T at the neutral axis is just the uh, width here, which is 0.1 meters. And T at B is going to be this vertical distance right here, which is 12 millimeters, which is 0 0.012 meters. And because it's so small, that's why we have to look at that point as well, or that we should. If it was all homogeneous in terms of, um, in terms of cross section, we could guarantee that it would be the largest here. But let's take a look. All right, Q at the neutral axis. We have two pieces. Q at the neutral axis is going to be Q at one, Q of one plus Q of two. Q of one is gonna be YDA, which is six millimeters down. We already know that to be 69 millimeters, 0 .6, 0 0.069 millimeters times the area of the flange which is 0 0.012 in width times 200 or 0.2, um, I need that to be zero, 0.2 meters. This is Y times A for part two. We add in, this would be the width of the web times the height of half of the web, which if the whole thing is 150, 150 minus 24 because there's two flanges or two yeah two flanges that would be um, six two one twenty six half of one twenty six is sixty three so point oh six three and then if it's point oh six three we know that it's half of that from the neutral axis so divide it again by two and we get thirty one point five or 0.0315, okay? So my Q um, right at the neutral axis, which may be my maximum point is 0 0.069 times 0 0.012 times 0.2 plus the quantity um, 0 0.0063 times 0 0.0315 quantity equals. And that says my Q at the neutral axis is 0 
36405. And then I can say that Q over T at the neutral axis equals uh, this number divided by the thickness at the neutral axis, which is 0.1. So that is 0.0036405. And that would be in meters squared, okay? So all we really need to do is to decide if this number is bigger or that same ratio at this point is bigger. <coughs> all right, so at point B, my thickness is this, but what is my Q at point B? The Q is the area, which is just gonna be that little chunk of the flange. Yeah, it's not, okay, it's 100. So this is 100, this is 200, that means that it's 100 between here and here, so it's 50 millimeters from here to here, which is uh, 0 0.050 meters times the height, 0 0.012 times Y, which is six millimeters down from 75.069. So my Q at B is 0 0.05 times 0 0.012 times 0 0.069, and that value is 0.000414. And if I take that and divide it by my thickness, which is the 0 0.012, divide that by thickness at B, divided by 0 0.012, that value is 0 0.003. Four or five meters squared. So they're close, aren't they? Do you see that? But this is bigger. So that means that my tau at the neutral axis, even though that flange is so tiny, my Q at the neutral axis is still, or my tau at the neutral axis is still going to be bigger because the ratio of Q over T is bigger. Therefore, tau max occurs at the neutral axis, and its value is 10 kilonewtons over I, which is um, 3.958 times 10 to the minus 5. Then I could say Q over T, but I've already found that value. So it's just 0 0.0036405. And so I take those numbers and I multiply them out. Um, 10 times 0 0.0036405 divided by 3.958 multiplied by 10 to the fifth equals, and I get 919.8 kPa, which is odd because it's smaller than this number right here. So, I've got a flaw somewhere in my thoughts. Not in my thoughts, my thought process is correct. However, um, there's something wrong with my calculation on one of these two, and I don't know which one it is. So we'll go through that again, and we'll take, we'll take it up. We don't have time to do it today, but do you see how the thought process goes? You see what we do? Yeah. So each one of these problems is quite uh, complicated. Now, if we have an I-beam, we have to do all that stuff with the geometry and find those values. If, on the other hand, we just have a rectangle, I'm not gonna work this out because we really don't have time, but like on problem 618, we just have a rectangular cross section. That's 150 millimeters in height, and it's B in width. And we want to find what B it's going to take to bear a certain kind of a load. So this is gonna be one of your homework problems as well. I'm gonna draw this out for you so that you are able to determine, oh, this doesn't go all the way to the end, this comes out to here at D, okay? Now on this problem, the first thing is, here's my reaction at A, here is some other reaction, doesn't really even have a point name in it, but we have 7.2, a force there, we have a force here, we have a force here, and this one is 2.4 kilonewtons, uh, 4.8 kilonewtons and 7.2 kilonewtons. Okay, now the first thing is it says, what's the required B? 
Now, on this beam, V is not consistent across the board. V is going to change. So you need to do a V diagram. You need to do a free body diagram followed by a V diagram to find out what the value of V is because it's going to maximize somewhere in here. We need to determine where that is. So we can go ahead and do this by saying, first of all, uh, the reaction at A plus the reaction at the rolling support, which doesn't have a uh, letter assigned to it. Those are both plus, minus 2.4 minus 4.8 minus 7.2 equals zero, right? Just doing statics. So then we know that R sub A plus reaction at the rolling support is equal to the sum of these three numbers, which is uh, 2.4 plus 4.8 plus 7.2, and that is 14.4 uh, in kilonewtons. Now at this point we don't know how much is attributable to A and how much is attributable to R, so we need to do summation of moments. I would say do it about point A because that way we eliminate this one and we can solve directly for this. So here at A, um, if we take the moments about point A, this is going to push it in a clockwise direction, so it's negative. 2.4 times that distance of one meter, also clockwise, minus 4.8 times that distance, which is a total of two meters. We don't have, well then we have plus the reaction at R times the distance between those two which is three meters, and then minus 7.2 times that distance, which is three and a half meters. These things added together have to equal zero. And we can do this, we can solve directly for R. So we can say R sub R times three, I'm gonna bring this over to the other side, is equal to 2.4 times one, plus uh, 4.8 times two. Um, I can't do that one in my head. 7.2 times 3.5 is, uh, that's going to be minus also, so plus over here, 25.2. So that means that the reaction R is equal to the sum of these three numbers divided by three, which is 12.4 kilonewtons. 12.4 kilonewtons, and that means that my reaction at A is just two kilonewtons, isn't it? All right, so then we need to decide which section of this beam has the maximum V. So if we draw a free body diagram, what we have is two kilonewtons, 2.4 kilonewtons, 4.8 kilonewtons, 12.4 kilonewtons, and 7.2 kilonewtons. So we have to do a V diagram like we did in chapter five here. So from here to here, we have two kilonewtons pushing up, so our V looks like that, and it has a value of positive two kilonewtons from here to here. From here to here, we have two pushing up, 2.4 pushing down, so we have two minus 2.4 minus V equals zero, and so V becomes minus 0.4 from here to here. In the third section, from here to here, we have two pushing up, 2.4 and 4.8 pushing down, which is a total of six, 7.2. So we have plus two minus 7.2 minus V equals zero. That would be negative 5.2 is equal to V. So from here to here, it drops to negative 5.2 kilonewtons. And then from this section, if we backed it up this way, what do we see? Well, we could go the other way and we could put our V going up and we could say negative 7.2 plus V equals zero or V equals 7.2. So from here to here, our V is 7.2 kilonewtons.
Okay, so this is the section that we want to use, isn't it? When we're designing, we want to use the maximum value. Now, one thing I want to point out is this is negative 5.2, but we're looking for the, the maximum absolute value. In other words, if this absolute value, if this had been, for example, negative 9 kilonewtons, we would design for negative 9 kilonewtons of shear because shear is not, there's not a physical difference between negative and positive. It's just the direction of the Actually, was gonna spin. Ask that. Yeah. We were in the situation where we were right. Okay. Yeah. When you do that, it's the absolute value because there's not a diff, unless it's a really strange heterogeneous material, you don't have a difference. It's not like tension and compression. It's just a direction. What was so. negative shear? Um, it's just a direction. No, I mean like, like that's not treated as an absolute, like you're talking about some weird... Oh, the only time that you do that is when, you mean, not like, I'm not talking about materials, but like if you have, um, you might have a shear adding and subtracting. So really like right here, we're taking into account the sign by adding when we have more than two. We don't, you know, I mean, here you don't want to ask the question, do you add or, since shear doesn't really have a direction, you don't add two or two plus and two plus four. It's not 4.4 here in this section. It's just because they're spinning it in opposite directions. They actually mitigate each other. So that's really when the sign for shear comes in. Yeah, so. All right, so do you guys have any questions? All right, so what I want you to do then is uh, for your homework, I will put this in the assignment. We have 618, which I've already worked out the V numbers for you. And then I would like you to go through that I-beam and I don't know if I want you to find the error in my math or not. I was just trying to think about it. It's a really good problem. Um, I don't think Christian's yeah. clock changed. What's that? I don't think Christian's clock changed because he's, he's like, why is the lecture so What's going on? <laughs> So, um, let's do 638, that'll do. Okay, so these will be your two homework problems for this time. All right, tell Christian how silly we are with daylight savings time. Yeah. Have a good afternoon, everybody. We are silly us.